Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Robert Gordon, who is a professor of social science at Northwestern University, also the author of uh, a number of books, perhaps most famously this book right here, The Rise and Fall of American Growth. Uh, Welcome, Robert. Glad to be here. Well, like I said, this book is actually quite famous, and even though now it is nearly a decade old, um, the things that you point out in this book, right, which really is, um, I was rereading it just recently, and it, I, I could not believe how comprehensive it is, right, going all the way back to the 1870s, I suppose, is where it really takes off. And you, you really highlight um, how much we still sort of underestimate the radical transformations that took place over that decade, 1870 to 1970, and how perhaps we may also be overestimating <laughs> the extent to which things are changing since 1970. And so since my You, you my said life, decade, you mean century, the century between century. 1870 and 1970. Yes, those decades. And, you know, since my life more or less corresponds to the time period 1970 uh, till now, and uh, my father's life corresponded to that, that previous period beginning in around 1920s, and his parents, you know, started in the 1870s. I grew up with all sorts of stories about what life was like. Um, But you said that the inspiration for this book came about when you were, I guess you ran into this, this book called the the good old days (laughs) and, and they weren't so good. And and that's what really, you know, the the title of the book, the the good old days, they were really terrible. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And Um, and it had chapters on with cartoons and drawings of all the horrible uh, things that people went through, um, railroad cars that the smoke from the locomotive got inside the car and the passengers could hardly breathe. I remember that cartoon. Um, haven't looked at that book in a long time. Well, I just I just ordered a copy because I'd never heard of it, <laughs> so I figured I needed to check it out. But um, but I think that you know when we're trying to figure out progress, right? We we often fall back on things like GDP growth. And, um, I mean, we have to look to something. We're looking for some subjective perception of change is subject to all sorts of misconceptions and illusions. So we're looking for some objective metric. And so we often fall back on, on GDP per capita. And I think in this book, you, you highlight how, you know, as a metric, that does a pretty good job, but it misses out on a lot of stuff. Um, so, you know, what are sort of the, the inherent limitations of looking at things like GDP per capita? Uh, GDP, uh, the total amount that we produce, uh, does not reflect the full benefits to everyday households of the new inventions that came uh, came out. And one of the best examples of that uh, is the spread between 1870 and 1930 of running water and sanitation sewer pipes that uh, traversed almost every American city. Uh, Back before 1870, uh, typically people had to carry water into their houses. The water didn't come in through pipes. And think of all the underground pipes under all the streets of America. Most of those were laid in the inner cities back in this period of the late 19th and early uh, 20th century. It made an enormous difference in people's lives, but it didn't really factor into GDP uh, by anything like the quantity of difference that it made. A more recent example of the same idea is that uh, smartphones are an invention that uh, has very little impact on GDP. They're made abroad and treated as imports Uh, But social networks and the many functions of your uh, smartphone uh, make a big difference in everyday life. People have worked to try to quantify how much that is, but very little of it it goes into GDP. So this problem of um, national production not matching consumer welfare is is an old one. Um, And the invention of running water and indoor toilets is 
uh, perhaps the most evocative of those examples. I mean, is there a way to get around those those limitations? Right. I mean, you have to you have to study like really thorny each, quantity. You you've got to study each each product and uh, try to f figure out a way to uh, to estimate how much it's worth. Um, think of the difference made by electric light replacing candles and kerosene. Uh, the cost to the consumer of the electricity and the light bulbs uh, actually was less than constantly buying candles and buying kerosene lamps and kerosene oil. Um, but they were getting a much brighter light. Uh, that's another great example of how uh, the consumer benefit exceeded the contribution to GDP. And there's no way to get at that without um, tackling each individual product by itself. And that job has n never really been done fully. All we can do is point to these great inventions and uh, try to contemplate life without them. Contemplate the usefulness of your smartphone if electricity had never been invented. Now, now I remember when I was studying in grad school sort of the causes of the first Industrial Revolution, right, you know, there was this belief in, in the big push, right, and the idea that you had to increase the amount of capital available for each worker in, in order for productivity uh, to increase. Okay, now we, we don't generally think that way now. I mean, that's one thing that can increase productivity. But, you know, we tend to focus on this thing called total factor productivity. So could, could you talk a bit about, you know, how we, we measure total factor productivity and, you know, why it is that this managed to increase so much during the time period you discuss? Well, first of all, talk about plain old, the plain old word productivity means output per hour. So you take the total amount of production measured for the country by GDP, uh, and you divide it by the total number of hours of work. So-called total factor productivity uh, takes the same numerator, the same GDP, and divides it not just by labor hours, but by a weighted average of labor hours and the input of other things that matter, primarily capital. Uh, now, how do we weight together the labor hours and the capital? Uh, we take the share of total income that is earned by labor, let's say 70%, and the share of total income earned by capital, say 30%. So total factor productivity growth would be the growth of total output minus the contribution of labor, which is 0.7 times the growth in labor hours, minus the contribution of capital, which is 0.3 times the growth in capital input. Now, of course, measuring the capital input is a tough job on itself uh, because we have to take account of capital of quality changes in the capital. And one of the fuzzy dividing lines in measuring total factor productivity um, is how much of the innovation is attributed to the capital and treated as an increase in the quantity of the capital, thus diminishing that ratio I just expressed, and how much of it comes out as the difference between output and input growth. Uh, and that, that dividing line is, uh, is somewhat arbitrary. It depends on how good a job you do in taking account of the improved uh, quality of capital. A good example is uh, computers. Uh, computers could be measured as the dollars of expenditure on computers, um, or it could be measured as the output computers are capable of in terms of uh, uh, number of calculations per second. And, of course, we know that uh, computers have become exponentially more capable uh, year after year, dec decade after decade. The number of uh, transistors in a computer chip has uh, doubled every two years since uh, 50 years ago. Uh, so the, if we attribute all of the increased calculation power of computers to the capital, then we're not going to have much total factor productivity left. Um, but the, no matter how you do it, if you do it consistently, you still get a picture that the amount of production the economy can achieve uh, over uh, the long century and a half that we're talking about. 
uh, is noticeably more rapid in the period between 1920 and 1970 than it was either before or after. Now, all these great innovations that you describe in the book, right, from networking all of our, our homes, right, to uh, you know, moving everybody off the farm and into uh, more urban areas and also suburban areas. I mean, these happened in the early part of this period, but it was really towards the latter part of this period, particularly in the 1950s, I think, where total factor productivity growth was, was highest. So how, how do we explain that? I mean, you know, was it the 50s were certainly innovative, but but most of these innovations actually happened earlier, right? And, uh, yeah. and no, really you're kind of you're actually later. not right. If you look at if you look at the history of U.S. productivity growth, whether it's total factor productivity or regular productivity output per hour, uh, the most rapid growth was between 1929 and 1948 uh, mm-hmm. or 1950, and it uh, it doesn't help much to try to break down that 22 years uh, between 1929 and okay, 21 years and 1950 into how much was uh, before or after World War II. Um, right. The fact is that the economy was producing well under its capacity in, in the 1930s, and it's sort of a black box to figure out uh, how much the economy was capable of. But we were producing at full capacity in 1929, and we certainly were in 1948. And so the growth rate between those two years was um, by far the most rapid uh, that, we, uh, that we have had. Uh, there's an economist named Alex Field who claims that the 1930s were the most technologically progressive um, decade in history. Uh, and uh, while I've quibbled with him about the 30s versus the 40s, uh, the fact is that uh, the economy in 1941 at the end of the Great Depression was far more productive than it was at the beginning of the Great Depression. So there were lots of things going on behind the scenes in industrial labs, the invention of plastics and chemicals, the spreading of electric controlled machinery uh, that was happening uh, even as the economy was depressed and many factories were idle. Uh, Pulling back from that 20 year period, um, the growth of productivity really took off after World War I and came to a uh, halt as far as the uh, the most rapid period around 1970. Um, in my book, I have a uh, th- series of three bars that express the growth of total factor productivity uh, between 19 uh, between 1870 and the present, and you have a bar that goes up halfway. For 1920 to 19, 1870 to 1920, and then you have one in the middle that goes up way like this, and then after 1970, from then until 2010, another one that's about the same height as the first one. So, um, it really is a um, an amazing story. Now, many of, the, if not most, of the inventions that made possible that productive half century uh, after 1920 actually were invented starting around 1870. Uh, So it just took a long time for the fruits of these inventions to show up in in productivity. This is related to a point that uh, the famous economic historian Paul David made a long time ago, uh, that it was a good 40 years between the first electric dynamo, the first electric generator, Uh, installed in the Pearl Street generating station in Lower Manhattan in 1882 and the takeoff of manufacturing productivity around 1923. That's a good 40 years delay in the full effect of electricity. And of course, during that period, they were figuring out how how to harness electricity, how to make machines that were uh, individual size, so each worker had his own machine instead of having great giant steam boilers and systems of shafts and pulleys and belts that brought the power of the factory to the individual worker uh, with the inherent inefficiency of trying to power 
the tasks of individual workers with one central um, enormous power source. The invention of electricity made it possible to have many smaller machines tailored to each individual task, inherently a far more productive uh, way of operating. And that took off in the 1920s, clearly was improving behind the scenes uh, in the 1930s, came to fruition in the enormous amount the American economy produced during World War II. And then by 1948, uh, we just came out of that a much more productive economy than we'd gone into the Great Depression uh, 20 years earlier. Uh, the, full, the full story of exactly how that happened and how we became so productive in World War II uh, is, is still something of a mystery. Uh, the en enormous achievement of coordinating the conversion of all those factories from making um, silk stockings to making parachutes from making cars to making tanks, from making civilian airplanes to the enormous number of, of uh, aircraft, both military and civilian, that were um, manufacturing during World War II. The famous Willow Run factory uh, built by Henry Ford uh, out uh, near Ann Arbor uh, was built in nine months in 1941 and by early 1944 was turning out one four-engine bomber every hour. Every hour. Just a much more rapid pace of production than anything we're doing now. I mean, Boeing is struggling to produce 500 planes a year. Um, and yet we were putting together these thousands of parts into these complicated um, bombers that devastated Germany and Japan. Uh, in that very small amount of time. Well, I could go on and on about all these achievements, uh, but I'll let you focus in on the ones you're interested in. Well, I mean, you, you quote Robert Sola, who famously said uh, about a more recent time period that, you know, computers are everywhere except in the productivity statistics. I mean, w would contemporaries have said the same thing about electrification, I guess, in, in the early days, right, immediately after... Tom Edison, Tom Edison's it's, discoveries. It's unlikely they would. It's unlikely they would have said it because they didn't have productivity statistics. Uh, they didn't <laughs> have measures of GDP. Uh, our our measures of how much the economy produced, starting in 1870, going through 1929, um, are the work of heroic backcasting by economic historians uh, using contemporary measures of production of individual industries, and then uh, outside of manufacturing, trying to guess how much the economy was producing in the form of, of uh, services and transportation. Uh, so they wouldn't have said that uh, we can see electricity everywhere except in the productivity statistics uh, uh, if they had productivity statistics. Uh, the, the, the fact is uh, they could see everywhere. Let's not just... Uh, focus too much on electricity, as important as it was, we also had, by a remarkable coincidence, in the fourth quarter of 1879, we had not only Edison's path-breaking experiment that finally found a filament that would make an elect electric light bulb work, but we also had, on the other side of the Atlantic, um, Conrad Benz perfected the internal combustion engine. Uh, and after a delay of little less than 20 years, we got the first automobiles and the first trucks, um, and after that, the first tractors uh, that the internal combustion engine made possible. And soon after that, we had uh, Wilbur and Orville Wright with their uh, first airplane in 1903. Well, you see, so many things were happening so rapidly uh, then. We got electricity. We got the internal combustion engine. We got communications in the form of the telephone in 1876. Uh, the phonograph, the motion picture, electronic communications with Marconi in 1896. Um, you think of all the different dimensions of the modern world, and they were all basically invented within a 30-year period, both in Europe and in the United States. Now, there were specific characteristics of the American environment that allowed a lot of these things to 
develop in a much more accelerated way. I mean, apart from just the sheer scale of the American economy, you, you talked about some areas of public investment, right? I mean, in order for the cars to develop, you needed to have roads, right? I mean, if you didn't have roads, then, then cars would be kind of kind of useless, right? And so how did, wh what were some of the, the characteristics of, of the way, I don't know, public investment was made or the way in which these large public utilities that were, I guess, originally private utilities developed in, in the American context that, that allowed for the development of, of these technologies at scale? Well, uh, to, to start with what is, in the long run, view has got to be the most important invention, which is electricity. Uh, that was primarily developed by the private sector. Um, and um, private utility companies not only built the generators, but they also built the transmission lines uh, that came to the individual houses and factories. Um, if we think about the main transportation method of that period, the railroad, that was also private investment, uh, much of it financed by the export of capital from Great Britain, uh, where British companies bought shares in American railroads. Um, the American government was uh, heavily responsible for the spread of railroads throughout the United States by giving land grants of enormous quantities of land surrounding the railroad routes that the railroads could then sell off to the towns that would be made possible by the arrival of the railroads. Uh, so the government had that um, had that precedent of working in tandem with the private sector in making the land grants. Of course, in the case of the highway, there were very few toll roads, uh, so the uh, spread of highways across the United States, which really didn't start until after uh, 1910 or so, uh, was an achievement of a combination of federal government grants state governments building the highways, and city governments financing the building of city streets with local taxes. Um, as one landmark, the, um, the year 1915 is a useful benchmark because that's the period in which the number of motorized vehicles uh, surpassed the number of horse-drawn vehicles in American cities and rural farms. Uh, and it was really only after World War I that we got any kind of semblance of national highways that would allow you to drive from New York to San Francisco. Uh, following uh, 40, 50 years earlier when we got the first transcontinental railroads in 1869. Yeah, I find it interesting that the, it was the Postal Service, I think, that said, you know, we, we're only going to be able to deliver right, into your community if you, if you have roads, right? <laughs> That's right. And um, the American highway system consisted in the 20s and 30s with the ever-spreading U.S. route numbers, uh, which, as you remember, uh, you're too young to remember, uh, but uh, we had... U.S. Route 1 that went down the, the Atlantic coast and U.S. Route 99 and 101 that went down through California, uh, 101 along the Pacific coast and Route 99 down the Central Valley of California as federal highways. Then, uh, and then we had uh, U.S. 10 in the, in, through Minnesota and North Dakota and U.S. 90 down through Louisiana and Texas. Then when they... Uh, developed the so-called Eisenhower system of interstate highways, which was one of the most benevolent and benign forms of public investment ever uh, conceived, they reversed all the numbers uh, so that now the low, low number was on the Pacific Coast with I-5 going through the Central Valley, and the high number, you, uh, Interstate 95, of course, goes down the Atlantic Coast, and the same reversal from north to south of the east-west highways. So we have Interstate 90 in the north and Interstate 10 in the south. Um, the interstate highway system uh, and the enormous increase in the feasible spread of trucking, uh, feasible speed of trucking, uh, that was built out between the late 1950s and the early 1970s 
is one of the reasons why productivity growth was so rapid uh, in that period of the 1950s and 60s. Um, when we strip out the role of the business cycle, uh, which made productivity go down in recessions and go up in expansions, and take account of that factor, um, it's clear that productivity growth was at its most rapid between 1948 and about 1966, and then began to slow down uh, through 1972 and then slowed down very substantially, um, partly due to the dislocation uh, created by the oil crisis and increase in the price of oil that happened in the mid-1970s. No, I we think shouldn't. the most provocative – go ahead. Go ahead. I think the most provocative point in, in the book that, that has raised quite a bit of discussion is, is the idea of the slowdown since that peak period. And it, it's hard to dispute the, the data, but is, is – I mean, is this inevitable? Uh, I mean, simply because there are transformations that can only happen once? I mean, if we, we look at, you know, infant mortality, I mean – you know, when you reduce infant mortality by 90%, it's kind of hard to, you know, do anything that's going to be quite as dramatic going forward. Is, is it just the nature of diminishing returns? Or is, is there something about the structural conditions for innovation in today's world that, that make it more difficult? Well, let's take the example of speed. Uh, Speed increased when we replaced the sailing ship by the steamship. Speed increased when we replaced horse-drawn carriages with railroads. Uh, speed increased again on the land uh, when we replaced uh, horse-drawn uh, carriages with motor cars. And speed increased again when we invented the piston airplane. It increased one last time uh, when we invented the jet airplane. The Boeing 707 was introduced in 1958, and it flew faster in 1958 than our traditional com than our commercial airplanes like the Boeing 737 uh, uh, travel now. Uh, current airplanes don't fly as fast as they could because the, to fly faster would use too much fuel, and fuel is much more expensive in relative terms now than it used to be. Uh, so that's one clear example of how we we reach the end of the road at increasing speed uh, because to go faster than the current airplanes fly would involve breaking the sound barrier. Uh, and that creates an intolerable amount of noise, uh, which prevents any suggestion that we have um, uh, supersonic airplanes flying over land. Uh, and it's prevented the, the development of supersonic airliners, which turned out to be uh, uneconomical. It simply took too much fuel to push airplanes past the speed of sound, and so the British and French Concorde was eventually grounded as uneconomic uh, about 20 years ago. So that's a great example. Now, uh, we shouldn't act or talk as if all productivity growth stopped after 1970, because we did have the things we've been talking about electricity, the internal combustion engine, communications, radio, television, all those things are part of what we call the second industrial revolution. Uh, you studied as a student the first industrial revolution back in the late 18th century with the invention of uh, steam engines and uh, power looms and power weaving. Um, but there's a third industrial revolution uh, with the invention first of the mainframe computer and then in the 1980s the personal computer that came to a, a head in terms of its productivity impact in the late 1990s and early 2000s. This was the period when we made the transition in every business office, um, in every small uh, business, in every large business, in every supermarket, uh, from typewriters and file cabinets and old-fashioned um, electric cash registers uh, to personal computers hooked together with the Internet uh, equipped with search engines, tied together with broadband, with retail businesses having barcode scanning, electronic management of inventories, and as a result of this tremendous 
uh, arrival, more or less at the same time, of the different uses of computers. Uh, in, in a sense, the uh, the transition from the mainframe computer to the personal computer in the 80s and 90s was analogous to the transition from the big steam engine in the middle of the factory to the individual small electric motors stationed at every workstation of every worker. Um, so the uh, personal computer age made possible a, a distribution of computing power at every workstation, every uh, typist, every secretary all of a sudden had enormously more power. No more retyping of manuscripts, no more wasted time uh, retyping letters, uh, no more use of dictaphones because most people started typing their own letters on their personal, personal computers with the invention of email. Uh, so that brought a revival of productivity growth, both conventional productivity and total factor productivity, that extended for not 50 years like the earlier one, but about eight years. In our productivity data for the United States, we have a distinct revival of productivity between 1990, basically 1995 and 2005, to more or less the same rapid growth that had occurred before 18, 1970. The problem is, and the reason why my book talks about the faltering of innovation, is that it, was only, it only lasted for eight or ten years. And then productivity growth slowed down again because we had put into effect the big rewarding uses of the personal computer and the Internet. Um, now, of course, the invention of the smartphone is a, is a different story. Uh, there, I think we have a, a big case of, of benefits not being uh, included in GDP uh, with everybody carrying around a small computer in their, uh, in their pocket. Uh, we were at lunch today in the economics department, um, and we were... Uh, the conversation drifted from the fact that the next American economic meetings will be in San Antonio, and then that brought up the Alamo, that brought up the American-Mexican War, it brought up how much uh, territory um, America got from Mexico as a result of that small and short war. Um, and then we had a debate among us as to how much territory Mexico got as opposed to the Louisiana Purchase. Well, one of the uh, younger faculty members immediately pulled out their phone and within seconds had a map of the Louisiana Purchase uh, on their uh, sitting right there at the dining table. Uh, so those things are obviously consumer surplus that are not part of GDP. Um, and uh, we have not yet got any kind of consensus about how... Uh, how valuable that is. Uh, of course, you're bound to ask at some point about the prospect for artificial intelligence and in bringing another big productivity revival. Uh, and that is a matter of increased discussion and debate among uh, economists, uh, with the consensus being that no one knows and no one is sure. Uh, but I can offer a little, uh, a few. Uh, uh, reflections to be a little bit skeptical on that if you want to talk about it. Well, well, I do, but um, I, I guess some people might have a difficult time reconciling what, what they perceive to be a radical um, transformation in their everyday lives with the, you know, relatively um, non-impressive <laughs> Uh, changes in, in productivity statistics. I mean, if I just sit down and look at what I'll cook on a given evening and compare it to what, you know, I cooked back in the 1970s as a kid, I mean, you go to the local supermarket in a well-to-do neighborhood and you have carrots and celery and iceberg lettuce. And now, you know, with one click of a mouse, I can have all sorts of food products from, from anywhere in the world. I mean, even looking at that, it seems like that's something that's not going to be picked up, right, the increase in, in variety of, of merchandise. Um, and, and of course, you know, being able to have the world's information at one's fingertips. I mean, here in Silicon Valley, everyone believes that things like Uber and, and Google and, and Facebook and so forth are, are radically transforming the world. I mean, is it more difficult to measure 
these sorts of changes than the changes in that that flowed from the second industrial revolution? Is there something inherently more difficult about them? I think I think uh, this gets back to the distinction between consumer surplus and uh, GDP that we talked about earlier. Um, the the enormous difference made by indoor bathrooms, by electric light, uh, by changing the whole definition of night and day, um, produced a, a huge change in consumer well-being for those who lived in the 1920s compared to those who lived in the 1860s. Um, the uh, uh, Uber is a good example of uh, an increase in convenience that does not show up in the productivity statistics. You still have one passenger and one driver. Uh, it's just that for the passenger, it was far easier to locate the driver, to make the match between the driver and the passenger than it was back in the days of the, the yellow taxi. Um, you called a taxi on the phone, you had no idea when it was coming, where it was, um, and uh, people stood out in the, in the street in the winter waving at uh, waving for taxis. It may have worked in midtown Manhattan where there were so many of them, but it didn't work in most other parts of the country. Uh, so uh, Uber is a great example of an increase in, in convenience. Of course, searching with Google compared to the old days of encyclopedias and dictionaries uh, and going to the library is an even better example of the convenience of uh, obtaining information. Um, so, uh, I mean, I remember standing in front of the copy machine at the library as a grad student for, you know, a good two hours a day, you know, Xeroxing old journal articles and stuff. And, uh, that, that's all gone. I remember carrying punch cards, uh, when I did my PhD thesis in 1967 and they had all sorts of tables in the back, we had a little computer, a little mainframe computer in the basement of the economics department. Um, but to uh, to do to get your printout, uh, you would have to take the punch cards that were produced by the computer and carry them across the room to the printer, and they were two separate operations, not even connected by a wire. Uh, so uh, there's been uh, there's been plenty of progress, and a lot of that came uh, into fruition in that period that I mentioned between 1995 and 2005, where it even showed up in the productivity statistics. Uh, about seven years after Robert Solo made his famous pronouncement of how we can see the computer age everywhere but in the productivity statistics. Now, when people talk about the impact of artificial intelligence, I mean, you know, first of all, artificial intelligence has, has been with us, you know, for a while. There's just new generations of flavors of artificial intelligence. Should, should we expect the, the, the latest generation to be any different in terms of its impact from the previous generations of uh, well, of automation your, and, and machine learning? Your, your, first, your first point that artificial intelligence has been around for a while is one of the first ones I would make. Um, we've had job losses uh, throughout the last decade as artificial intelligence and voice recognition have made possible the replacement of most customer service agents by automated customer service calls. We all hate them. We try to figure out what magic words or, or pushes on the phone dial will get us connected with a human agent uh, because the uh, artificial intelligence responses are so rigid, uh, but they're gradually improving. Uh, language translation. Uh, my doctor uh, uh, used to, uh, instead of typing in uh, as so many doctors do on the computer, uh, used to dictate uh, his uh, patient notes and uh, have them typed up by a machine that was uh, fully equipped with voice recognition. Uh, so we've had that for quite a while. Um, I think to uh, in interpret chat GPT and the potential for job losses, for pro future productivity gains, it helps to break down uh, the economy into three groups of workers. Uh, one group produces goods in mines, in farms, in factories. Um, and they're producing objects 
with other objects. Uh, they're not involved in creating textual or visual material. Um, and so I think the impact in the goods sector is going to be fairly minor, certainly compared to the uh, development of, of automation. And we could talk separately about the, the use of robots, which is, of course, mainly in manufacturing. Then the second so group... So, for, uh, for instance, somebody who's... I just had a new... Uh, some new masonry done on my, you know, patio. And uh, I, I don't think that the methods have changed in, in 100 years, I, but I think that the, the guy is doing it is he's getting quite well compensated now. Yes, he's getting perhaps. compensated, and that's, that's part of Baumol's cost disease. Um, mm-hmm. Baumol, this is very relevant to chat GPT too. Um, Baumol used the example of a string quartet. A string quartet, if you're, at least if you're seeing them live, um, can it, cannot improve its productivity and the amount of music it plays by the four players. Um, but all the other occupations are benefiting from more machines, more automation, more inventions. And so the productivity in the rest of the economy goes up uh, and people's wages go up. So to get people to be willing to play string quartets, you have to keep raising the wages of the uh, players and thus it costs more and more uh, to go to see a concert. Well, uh, the same thing is true uh, with ChatGPT. You have some parts of the economy, like your mason, and by coincidence, we're having an, an old masonry wall um, rebuilt right as we speak um, uh, by masons that are using 100-year-old techniques. Uh, and Probably the wall itself is 100 years old, and it's not going to look any different when they finish than it did 100 years ago. It's just going to they keep, they're keeping it from falling down. Uh, so you have these occupations. Then you have the uh, what we might call contact services, retail, wholesale, restaurants, hotels, um, and much of medicine and education is still one-on-one. Nurses, hospitals full of people uh, delivering meals, pushing patients around, uh, en- entering hospital rooms, delivering pills, changing beds. Uh, a lot of manual labor that's not being replaced by robots and is not going to be affected by chat GPT. Uh, it turns out that the uh, number of employees in those two sectors, uh, the goods and the contact services, are about 70% of employment. That leaves maybe 25 or 30% in the parts of the economy that have been so uh, amenable to working at home, to working from home. That would be Uh, information technology, administration, legal, uh, finance, insurance. Those occupations are going to be impacted by ChatGPT, but each one in a different way. Um, Some of the most vulnerable uh, sub-occupations that we read about, uh, just reading about yesterday, uh, illustrators of book covers. There's almost nothing that uh, artificial intelligence can't create in the form of an image for a book cover. Uh, And the work of individual artists who used to do this by hand is probably going to go away quite rapidly. Uh, Doing routine marketing uh, brochures is probably going to be uh, automated in a way that was was never uh, possible before. Uh, So a lot of people who work with text are going to find that their jobs are going to be uh, replaced. It's going to happen very slowly and for two, two reasons. One is that people, we still need people to tell the uh, language machine what to do, and we need people at the other end to check it for errors. And there are all sorts of errors that come in as these chat GPT machines scan the Internet not knowing what on the internet is right and what is wrong, what is an appropriate analogy, what is not an appropriate analogy. Um, Some of the most immediate effects of ChatGPT are actually affecting education or affecting a seminar I will be teaching in only six weeks uh, on the role of economics in the two world wars where my students are going to write essays. And the first essay they write is going to be on the causes of World War I. And I can imagine, without some rather draconian rules and tricks on my part, 
that I could get um, 15 students to submit identical essays generated by ChatGPT on the causes of World War I. Um, so uh, that's uh, an immediate effect of large language machines in the education sector. It is not going to affect productivity. If anything, it's going to uh, raise the workload of instructors as they, as they try to figure out uh, how to deal with it. Uh, so I think the, the future, uh, it's bound to improve productivity, uh, but uh, in my own recent research, uh, if we compare the forecasts of productivity growth that are uh, baked into the government's budget forecasts and economic forecasts, uh, our productivity over the last nearly 20 years has been running somewhat slower uh, than they're assuming for the future. Uh, so there's room for productivity growth to improve um, by a substantial amount without really changing the overall outlook for this enormous increase in public debt uh, that is going to go together with higher interest rates and severely impede the ability of future governments to finance Medicare, Social Security, and the general operations of government. Well, towards the end of the book, you, you mentioned some headwinds, right? You say that historians probably shouldn't be in the business of forecasting, but that you're going to give it a go anyway. And, and so you mentioned these headwinds. And, and I'm wondering, since this book was nearly a decade old, whether or not you see those headwinds as being you know, stronger or, or weaker. And, and I guess you know, when we look back at the 30s and, and the 40s, I mean, certainly we wouldn't want to take away from that period that if we really want to jumpstart productivity, we should have a, you know, recession and, and a war. But, but I mean, are there some, some policy prescriptions that we can learn from the, the, the time period that you studied that, that might be helpful when it comes to reducing some of these, these headwinds? Well, let's first of all talk about what some of the headwinds are. Um, one of the main ones is education. Uh, we had uh, a total transition in the American economy uh, from the late 19th century uh, when only 10% of students completed high school uh, to 1980 when about 85% of the people uh, completed high school. Uh, the percent that, in, that completed college uh, has very gradually increased so that roughly 40% uh, 35 to 40 percent of our 30-year-olds uh, have completed a four-year college education. That still leaves 60 percent or so who have not. Um, and we have a, a big problem. Not only is the pace at which the college attainment is slowing down, uh, but a large fraction, a surprisingly large fraction of those who get four-year college degrees can't find a job that requires a college degree. Those are your baristas in Starbucks and the very educated people you meet in many restaurants and retail stores that seem to uh, be too intelligent to be working in uh, what are basically very menial uh, jobs. So that's one of the headwinds. The, the fact that during the 20th century we had a big boost to our productivity coming from the spread of secondary education and then uh, tertiary uh, higher education uh, that's that's slowing down. Another big problem is inequality. We've had a big increase in uh, contrast the period between World War II and 1975, uh, which has been called the Great Compression. The compression of the high incomes and the low incomes came closer together, um, with the uh, lower income middle class benefiting from the uh, widespread power of labor unions to boost their real in income and the relatively um, low values of the stock market which uh, compressed the incomes of the high income people who owned a lot of stock. Uh, starting in the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, this was reversed. The incomes at the low end were compressed by the gradual weakening of unions, the spread of right-to-work laws, the um, continual erosion of the real purchasing power of the minimum wage, uh, and the general uh, re reduced bargaining power of workers, while at the top uh, we had an incredible increase in the relative income of top executives compared to average workers. In 1975, 
the average CEO of a large corporation earned 30 times that of the median worker. Um, by 1995-2000, that ratio was no longer 30, it was 300, a tenfold increase in the ratio of CEO pay to um, average workers. We have the superstar phenomenon. Uh, as media have becoming uh, more, more uh, uh, widespread, the uh, relative income of sports stars and entertainment stars has increased uh, until you, uh, you have uh, sports stars being paid 10, 20, 30 million dollars a year uh, while the income of the average, average or median American worker is increased by a pathetic half to 1% a year uh, since the late 1970s. So that's inequality. Um, and uh, that was uh, partly made possible not only by the CEO pay and the, and the superstar pay, but also by the fact that the um, stock market has exploded as a share of GDP. Uh, the, believe it or not, in 1982, the S&P 500 average was only a value of 100. Um, today it's around 4,400. That's an increase of 44, a factor of 44. Uh, and that feeds into the uh, well-being, not just the wealth, but also the income of those who are paid with uh, stock options. Um, so those are some of the, uh, just two of the headwinds. Um, and in, uh, uh, in suggesting policies uh, to deal with them, uh, I, I focused on the inequality and education problem together. Uh, we have, um, we have, of course, the big controversy about affirmative action uh, and the the need to give a special advantage to those uh, in high school who who don't qualify on their test scores for uh, college admission. Well, if we look at the disadvantaged groups, their test scores are. Uh, way below uh, the majority white population um, at the end of high school, in the eighth grade, in the third grade, in kindergarten. We have a real problem in uh, this country, more so than in some other countries, about the abilities, the relative abilities of young children. And the way to deal with that is preschool. Uh, we need a nationwide uh, program of preschool that is directed toward low-income families. Um, we've just had a, a big uh, study that's come out uh, from the uh, Opportunity Insights group at Harvard, uh, which has done an amazing job of stitching together huge amounts of data on... That's with uh, the, Raj Chetty, right? That's Raj Chetty and, and uh, John Friedman, um, who have just come out with a big study of SAT scores and shown that there's a completely perfect correlation uh, between parental income and SAT scores. The top SAT scores are earned by the children of the top 1% in the income distribution. People from the bottom 20% in the income distribution never get, almost never get, top SAT scores, or even in the top half. Uh, so this is a deeply fundamental problem of inequality in educational attainment, and it is not a fault of the schools. It's a, it's a problem that goes back to the family, the difference in the childhood environment of uh, children who, are, who have college-educated parents uh, compared to those who, who don't, and particularly children who grow up with uh, single parents. Uh, so we need a much more serious job of uh, preschool education, and that's the kind of thing we need. We've got this enormous difference in life expectancy between college-educated and non-college-educated um, households, uh, recently uh, studied by Ann Case and Angus Deaton of Princeton. And uh, that uh, is both a matter of um, the devastating effect 
on low-income people of the loss of jobs. Uh, Angus Deaton is a big uh, opponent of free trade uh, because he's seen the damage that factory closings have done to the well-being and income of blue-collar workers. Um, whatever you think about free trade, uh, we've got a huge problem in this country that has to do with the lack of universal medical care, the enormous expense of medical care that bankrupts people even with decent medical insurance. Um, and uh, that's something that uh, ideally, if we want to uh, break through some of these headwinds to future progress. And if you, you want to ask a simple question, uh, what is ChatGPT going to do to inequality? Well, maybe it's going to take more jobs away from relatively high-paid workers who are in the business of creating words and images. Um, without we'll effect, get more masons. Right, and not have an effect on the relative income of masons. Um, we, we're, uh, we're still going to have um, the need for individual manufacturing workers, uh, farmers, even with their... Uh, ever better machines, uh, and we're going to still have the need for people to stock the grocery store shelves. And uh, as productivity languishes in those industries, uh, we're going to have the Baumol effect working again, that uh, productivity growth is going to be slow in some parts of the economy, uh, balanced by more rapid productivity growth in some of the more creative uh, word-producing or image-producing uh, sectors. And so just to connect it back to productivity, it's not so much the fact that the rich are getting so rich, but that there's a huge segment of the population that is being made less productive because we're failing to invest in them. Yeah, and um, my intuition is that we'll get some productivity benefit uh, from chat GPTs. Some of it will offset the um, gradual slowdown that's occurring as we run out of innovations in other, uh, in other sectors. Um, and uh, it, it could well be that looking back at the decade between 2023 and 2033, our productivity growth shows some signs of revival. I don't expect anything uh, to match the decade of the 90s and early 2000s uh, because I don't see uh, the large language models as being analogous mm -hmm. to the replacement of typewriters and file cabinets, the general um, elimination of the need to deal with paper and having everything instantly available on a screen. Uh, that's just a quantum leap in uh, the ability of everyone working with um, words and images uh, that I think exceeds the kind of change that we're likely to see. Uh, if you don't mind, I've got uh, obligations here. Uh, wrap so up. Maybe we could wrap up with your last couple of questions. Yeah, I'll just wrap up. Well, Robert, look, let's let's hope you're wrong. <laughs> but that, that in fact, we will hopefully once again see the kind of productivity increases that we saw during this century that you describe so well in this book. It's called The, the Rise and Fall of American Growth. Um, check it out it's it's a classic uh and i hope that uh you you can someday update it with uh, some new chapters well we'll see we'll see whether uh that happens uh, uh soon enough unsiloed podcast is produced by university fm elevating the stories of your institution 